I was going to preach this sermon last week, and of course we had a had the parish here and singing, and it was a great concert, great testimony she had. Uh, two weeks ago we had great testimony. I'm going to add some scriptures. Are actually, I know most of you look at it and go, oh my goodness, I have many scriptures. How long is he going to preach today? Don't worry, we'll get out of here today. Uh, and uh, we have, so we've added a few, a few more scriptures to it. And I want to, I just want to talk about being thankful. You know, some of the times I think that in our life we're like ungrateful children. And I know what ungrateful children are. We raised five kids. I understand when a child is not grateful how that a parent feels about a child that's not grateful. I understand that when we sometimes take advantage of a situation or even advantage in our lives, I have to think as Christians how God must feel. When God says, I've given you everything, and yet you don't want to give me anything. When God looks at us and he says, you don't even, you're not even thankful for what you have, and give God the glory. We live in a day when people think they've made it. We live in a day and people think that they have, they have succeeded in life and became whoever they wanted to become, and it was all them. But I want to tell you, you've done nothing that God hasn't gifted you to be able to do. And we need to praise God and thank God for what we have and who we have in our lives. And you say, well, I just don't have... I hear people all the time, I don't have that much to be thankful for. You're one of those ingrates I was just talking about. Whenever you wake up in the morning, you can thank God that you have breath. Even if it hurts like the dickens to get out of bed, you can thank God you got out of bed. Even though these old bones may ache and they may crack and they may that snap, crackle, pop, rice, crispy treatment on you, you can thank God that you're still going. And even though things in your life don't always seem like they're right or always seem like the way they should be, you can thank God that at least... He is with you all the time. What I want to do is not just for this. We're at the end of Thanksgiving. We should have all sat around and told each other all these thankful things. We didn't do that at our place because I guess we're not that thankful either. But anyway, uh, but what we need to be able to do is every day of our life, thank God. And God's Word talks a lot about that. You see, David was one of those that was a man after God's own heart, even though he wasn't perfect by any means. But he knew how to thank God. Boy, I tell you what, what we need to learn is how to thank God and praise God. Not because of what somebody thinks or doesn't think, but because of who God is. We need to give him the glory. So we're going to actually start off, uh, I think you put in there for me, I think it was 8 through 12 or something like that, and you will find out in a second. All right, yes, first... Chronicles 16.8. God's word says, Give thanks to the Lord and proclaim his greatness. Who do you give thanks to? The Lord. Who do you proclaim? His greatness. He goes on to say, Let the whole world know what he has done. Did you notice it doesn't say, Let the whole world know what you've done? Because let me tell you something, What you and I have done doesn't mean much. It's what God has done in and through us that means everything. It says, tell the whole world. Let them know what God has done. Sing to him. Yes, sing his praises. Tell everyone about his wonderful deeds. Man, I want to tell you, we ought to glorify God in song. We ought to sing to God, praise God. And we need to, listen to what it says, tell everyone. Not just someone. Tell everyone about his wonderful deeds. Tell everybody what God's done in our lives. We go on in verse 10 and it says, Exalt him in the holy name. Rejoice, you who worship the Lord. You know, instead of griping about things, maybe we ought to learn this. To rejoice. You know what I found in my own life? When I start rejoicing more, I start griping less. 
You know, when I start looking at things that God has done, I quit looking at the things that other people have done. When I start praising God more in my life, I want to tell you, I see what God is doing in my life even more. So I challenge you to praise God, give God the glory, worship Him like never before. And I'm not just talking about when you're in the bathroom or in the shower and nobody else can hear you. I'm talking about when other people can hear you. Let people know what God's doing in your life and what God has done in your life. If you and I focus on everything that's wrong, you and I will only see what is wrong. But when you and I focus on the things of God, you and I will see what God is doing in our lives. Very easy principle. Verse 11 says, search for the Lord and for his strength. Listen to this, and I love this. Continually, all the time, continually, every moment, every day, seek him. If there's nothing else we can get out of this morning, are we seeking God every moment of every day? And verse 12 says, Remember the wonders he has performed, his miracles, and the rulings he has given. Then we're going to skip down in the chapter to 16.23. It says, Let the whole earth sing to the Lord. Each day proclaim the good news that he saves. You know you and I are nothing without salvation. You and I are nothing unless we give God the glory for what God has done in our lives. And if you know Jesus Christ as personal Lord and Savior, then you can rejoice and tell people that Jesus saves. Oh, I'm not talking about just saying, oh, I just want to give the glory to God. I'm talking about saying, man, I want to tell you, God's done a miraculous thing in my life. I prayed to God, and he answered my prayer. I gave God my life to him, and it's a miracle. He snatched me out of hell, and now I'm going to spend eternity with him in heaven. <laughs> Praise God. You can clap about that because there's nothing more to clap about than knowing Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. It does not stop there. It starts there, and that's when you and I should do everything we could do to continually seek him, continually follow him, continually read his word, apply it to our hearts, allow the Holy Spirit to do a work within us. We go on to verse 24, and it says, Publish his glorious deeds among the nations. Tell everyone. You get that again? Everyone again. Not just someone, just not just one person, not just two. Tell everyone about the amazing things he does. You know, one of the problems with our churches today, people aren't seeing the amazing things that God's doing in the lives of the church today. And if people started seeing what God was doing in the lives of God's people, the church today, I got a funny feeling more people would come to Jesus because they know that there's a Jesus that answers prayer and saves souls. We go on to verse 25. It says, Great is the Lord. He is most worthy of praise. He is to be feared above all gods. I really believe one of the problems today, too, we don't fear God. You know, my dad was a disciplinarian, and he was a doggone good one. Not to my sister. She got away with everything. He was daddy's little girl. But us boys... I want to tell you. And you know what I feared? I feared, and this is the wrong thing to fear, but I feared getting caught because I knew what Dad would do. Let me tell you something. You and I can't do anything without being caught because our Heavenly Father knows exactly what we do. And we ought to fear Him. We ought to fear Him. We ought to ask God to forgive us, to cleanse us once again. In verse 26 it says, The gods of other nations are mere idols, but the Lord made the heavens honor and majesty surround him. Strength and joy fill his dwelling. Now let me just ask you this. If you have Jesus Christ in your heart today, which I hope everybody in here does, but if you don't, you can find out in a little while how to receive him. But if you have Jesus in your life, the Holy Spirit dwells within you. And God says, 
strength and joy fills his dwelling. And the Holy Spirit dwells within us. You and I have strength in the Lord. And you and I have joy in the Lord. If we don't allow this old world and Satan to rob it from us. We go on. O nations of the world, recognize the Lord. Recognize that the Lord is gracious and strong. Give to the Lord the glory he deserves. Bring your offering and come into his presence. Worship the Lord in all his holy splendor. You know, sometimes I think we just need to allow the splendor of God to get in to our minds and our hearts to understand that as holy as God is he cared about you and I enough to send his only son to die on the cross for our sins no matter how rotten we've been and he knew how rotten we would be since the beginning of time but he still loved us enough that Jesus died for you and for me let all the earth tremble before him. The world stands firm and cannot be shaken. As we go on. Let the heavens be glad and the earth rejoice. Tell all the nations, the Lord reigns. Now I want to tell you, you and I can't tell the nations God reigns if he doesn't reign in our lives says, let the sea and everything in it shout his praise. Let the fields and their crops burst out with joy. Man, I want to tell you, if the fields and the crops and everything in the world, can, the ones that he made in his own likeness, in his own image, can surely praise him and praise the Lord. Let the trees and the forest sing with joy before the Lord, for he is coming to judge the earth. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His faithful love endures forever. All right, how, how long does God's love endure? Forever. You know what that simply means? If you know Jesus Christ, he's always there. He's always there with you. He's always there to be there when you call upon him. He's always there to forgive you of your sins. He's always good to restore you in him. My God is always there. He endures forever. You and I need to understand that. He's not a flash in the pan. He is eternity. And we can't understand that. But we think it's a long time in this world. I want to tell you, when you and I get to heaven, eternity is eternity forever and ever, and we're going to be in the presence of a holy God. I'm going to go to 1 Thessalonians 5, 16. It says, always be joyful. How come Christians run around like they've been sucking on lemons and eating persimmons? How come Christians always go around like somebody ran over their dog? How come somebody, how come Christians go around like everything's wrong? I've seen so many Christians that go around with their head down, only telling them, about, oh, it's just this old world's been so rough on me. No, the world hadn't been rough on you. You haven't given yourself over to God so that God could do what he needs to do in you. You see, the problems that we have in this world can all be solved with God. The testimony we heard last week, the only answer is God. Oh, you might be going through some tough times. Guess what? God went through tougher times. Jesus went through tougher times than you and I will ever go through. What I'm going to tell you to do that most preachers won't tell you to do. Pull up your big boy panties and your big girl panties and get busy doing what God has you to do. Never stop praying. 1 Thessalonians 5, 17. 1 Thessalonians 5, 18 says, Be thankful in all circumstances. Wait a second. Be thankful in all circumstances? What? I don't get to gripe and complain and bellyache and talk bad about things 
I don't get to gripe about somebody else and what they've done to me because after all, I deserve so much more. Let me tell you, I don't deserve anything. Jesus Christ has given me everything. He says, be thankful in all circumstances for this is God's will for you who belong to Christ Jesus. What's God's will for you? To be thankful, to be grateful, to give God the glory, to give God the praise, to have joy that can only come from him. And you say, well, I just don't know. I just don't have joy. It's because you may not know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And if you do know him, you haven't committed yourself completely to him. 1 Thessalonians 5, 9 says, teen says, do not stifle the Holy Spirit. I want to tell you, I believe if there's anything that I'm good at, if there's anything that maybe we're good at, it's stifling the Holy Spirit. You say, well, Pastor, what in the world does that mean? That means when God is telling you to do something, you don't do it. That means when God is working in your heart and life and God is telling you what you ought to be doing and you say, no, I just can't do that. It's when instead of being a godly witness and a Christian witness, you're being just the opposite and you're letting the world take control of your life and Satan lead you instead of God guiding you. First Thessalonians 5.20 says, Do not scarf at prophecies. He goes on to say, But test everything that is said. Hold on to what is good. You and I need to test by God's word and the spirit of God what is of God and what is not. And let me tell you, you don't find out what's not of God by talking to other people. You find out by going to the source with his God and God's word and his Holy Spirit that will lead all of us to what he has for you and I. To do what is good. 522 says, stay away from every kind of evil. Hmm. Stay away from every kind of evil. When you find ourselves, and I've done this many times before, when you find when we find ourselves, this represents God and this is us, and we start turning away and looking at things in this world that entice us and start pulling us that way, what you and I need to remember, God's word says stay away from every kind of evil, and we need to run back to God. Because God is the right answer. God is the answer that'll get you through. When you're going to those drugs, you need to realize those are not of God. Run back to God. You're going to that bottle, you need to realize that bottle's not your answer. God's the answer. You're going to that anger in your mind, God is the answer. When you're going to those things in your mind and those things that always get you pulled off course, go back to God because God is the answer. And God's word says, stay away from every kind of evil. Satan to tell you, oh, it won't hurt you. Satan to tell you, oh, it's not that big a deal. Satan to tell you, oh, it's not that. It's only hurting you. It's not hurting anybody else. Listen, brother and sister, you're a child of God. If you're hurting you, you're hurting God's child. And shame on us for being, having that kind of attitude. Because God says stay away from every kind of evil. Hebrews 13.8 says, I heard somebody mention this just yesterday and today. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. My God never changes. So the question must be, why have you? God will never walk away from us. Why have we walked away from God? Isaiah 59, 1 and 2 says, Listen, the Lord's arm is not too weak to save you, nor is his ear too deaf to hear you call. I want to tell you, my God's always the same, yesterday, today, and forever. It's not his arms have not shortened. His ears still hear. And I'll tell you the one thing God will always hear. When a sinner comes to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior by asking forgiveness of their sin and putting God on the throne of their heart, and when a Christian comes to God and says, God, forgive me, I haven't been living the way you want me to live. And God, I haven't given you everything. I've held back some of that. But God, I want to give you everything today. 
You see, that's what it's all about. You see, God's word is very clear. We sometimes try to make it a lot harder than what it is. We sometimes want to read things into it, and we sometimes want to get somebody else's opinion. I want to tell you, I found out many years ago, opinions are like other things bodies have, and they stink. What you and I need to do is go to the Lord and go to his word, go to the Holy Spirit, and allow the Spirit to lead us to him and bring us back to him so that we might be right in him. Now I only mention a few things, of course, today, but you know right now in your minds and life what is not, doesn't belong to God. God, I am a firm believer that every Christian knows where they're not right with God. The problem is, are you willing to take care of that with God today? Say, God, forgive me. Forgive my sin. Heal me, O oh Lord. Come into my life if you don't know Jesus Christ. And I would beg you today that you would ask Christ to come into your life and save you today if you don't know my Jesus. I would just love to pray that sinner's prayer with you today. If you never ask him to come into your heart and forgive you of your sins, he'll do it because God is faithful and true and God cannot lie. And his Bible tells us, his word says it's the truth that he gave his son to die on the cross for our sins. All we have to do is invite him in. Today, if you're a Christian, would you just come and get things right with God? I'm going to ask Corey to come, and as he's coming, I'm going to ask you to stand, and we're going to say a short prayer, and then I'm just going to ask you to step out and do whatever the Holy Spirit leads you to do. Maybe you just need to come to pray. Maybe you need to rededicate that life. Maybe you need to give God the glory. Maybe you need to return to him, because there's parts of your life that you know don't belong to him. Would you give those up today? Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word today. Father, I pray that you do a mighty work in this place today. Father, I pray today that your spirit would move. And Father, I pray a hedge of protection around this place. Father, I pray that Satan will not be able to rob the victory. But Father, I pray your Holy Spirit, Lord, will hone in on our hearts and draw us to you. Father, we want to give you all the praise. We want to give you all the glory. Father, we give this time over to you. Help us, Lord, that strength that you give us to step out and do whatever you ask us to do. And these things we ask in Jesus' precious and holy name. Amen.